This is the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. We bring you real stories from out-of-the-box thinkers and trailblazers enacting change across the globe. Through sharing stories of struggles and triumphs, we form a community of like-minded individuals collectively uplifting the world through thriving movements and businesses. Change being overworked and underpaid. Change whether you believe you can do what you love to do. Change the idea you cannot be successful working on what you are truly passionate about. Change how your passions are funded and how much impact they can actually have. Change what you think you deserve and what you think you can achieve. Now here is your host, Tiffany Zahara. Hello, everyone, and welcome or welcome back to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is David Sloan Wilson. He is an American evolutionary biologist and a distinguished professor emeritus of biological sciences and anthropology at Binghamton University. He is a son of the author Sloan Wilson, co-founder of the Evolution Institute and co-founder of the recent spinoff nonprofit, ProSocial World. Dr. Wilson, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you, Tiffany. So you are one of the world's foremost evolutionary biologists. Can you explain what that means and the important work that you are doing in the world? Uh, Of course, Darwin's theory of evolution is famous and should need no introduction. But for most of the 20th century, it was confined to the study of genetic evolution, which is, of course, a slow process. And so your audience, entrepreneurs and activists of all sorts, don't necessarily think about evolution, about their change efforts. They're trying to change things culturally and often personally. So what's exciting and, and what my work represents is an expansion of Darwin's theory of evolution to cover any process that includes the ingredients of variation, selection, and replication. And let me just unpack this a little bit, Tiffany, at the very beginning. Darwin's insight was that organisms vary in just about everything that could be measured about them, uh, that those differences make a difference in terms of survival and reproduction, and that the traits of organisms tend to replicate in their offspring. Not only is this theory so powerful, but it's also So simple. So the three ingredients are things vary, those differences make a difference, and then there's some kind of replication that takes place. And what's exciting is that this powerful theory of evolution that's proven itself for the study of genetic evolution is now beginning to prove itself for the study of cultural evolution and personal evolution, so that all of a sudden, entrepreneurs and activists and change agents of all sorts have a new theory to apply to their change efforts. And so that's what I represent and what I'm trying to put into action through the organization ProSocial World. Thank you for that. Because I think there is just that, okay, so how does evolution tie into this? That's where I was really looking for you to unpack. So I, I appreciate that you did that. And you mentioned ProSocial World. So you founded these two nonprofits. What called you to create these? And especially since because you mentioned Pro Social World, it's a spinoff of the Evolution Institute. What makes these two organizations unique? Well, I started out as a scientist, an ivory tower type, not doing any kind of activism. But my topic was altruism, basically. How does everything that we associate with goodness, everything oriented towards the welfare of others or society as a whole, how can that evolve by a Darwinian process? And that can be asked of other species. It could also be asked of humans. And gradually, the more I studied altruism in relation to human life, then I wanted to become a practitioner. And so I started to do this first with my own research. At that time, I was living in Binghamton. So I started what was called the Binghamton Neighborhood Project. And I studied individuals that differed in their altruistic tendencies. Some are highly prosocial. By the way, I like the word prosocial better than altruism. It's a more general term. It refers to anything oriented towards the welfare of others or one's group as a whole. So I studied individuals that vary that way. And I just said, individuals vary in just about anything that could be measured. That goes for their prosocial tendencies. So just imagine the sweetest, most prosocial individual that you could possibly imagine, and then imagine their opposite. And how do they succeed and how do they fail in life? What are the advantages and disadvantages associated with this particular kind of individual difference? And so gradually, I wanted more opportunities to do this, working not just as an individual at my university. And so to create a nonprofit, the Evolution Institute was co-founded with a political scientist named 
Jerry Lieberman, and then ultimately my projects within the Evolution Institute grew sufficiently so that they spun off to become their own nonprofit. So, I mean, clearly we can do things as individuals or we can do things much better as groups. That's another general lesson that we need to get on the table here. Uh, groups that are appropriately structured are much more efficacious and much more fulfilling for their members than individuals trying to do things on their own. And so that's an important thing for us to be talking about as part of this conversation. Thank you. I always really push the idea that we're not in this alone because that when we're in the space, it can be very, very isolating as activists and change makers. It's, you know, depending on the parts of the world, there may be more or less support. But again, this is a community and we are all in this together. We're all trying to uplift the planet and do what we are feeling called to in our specific way. So I really appreciate that you really emphasize that working together as well. Yeah, Tiffany, it's one thing I can say as a biologist is that throughout our long history as a species, stretching back hundreds of thousands of years, and then the species that we came from, stretching back millions of years, individuals never lived alone. They always lived in the context of a group. And in the case of us humans, those groups were, for the most part, highly cooperative groups. So we always had others that we could rely upon and our brains and bodies evolved in that context. And so that means when you isolate individuals, and so many individuals are isolated in modern life, so they only have their own resources, our brain and bodies interprets that subconsciously as an emergency situation. An emergency situation has become the normal state of affairs for so many People. And so the most therapeutic thing you can do for individuals and what they do is to organize people into small and appropriately structured groups. And appropriate structure is key here because it's not that any group is good. We know from our experience, groups can be terrible things. So it's not that groups are always good, not at all. They must be appropriate structured. They must be doing meaningful work and so on and so forth. At ProSocial World, we've developed a methodology, basically, for helping groups become appropriately structured. That means that cooperation succeeds, and also those groups are adaptable. They're capable of change. That's something else that doesn't come for free. So anyhow, this is some of the tools that we've developed. When you're saying that the brain and the body interprets it as an emergency situation when we're in isolation, can you expand a little bit more on that? Because what I'm hearing when you're saying that is it's kind of like that fight or flight, that response when there's that perceived threat of danger. I mean, is that a similar analysis? Like, I mean, is that correct in what I'm imagining that to be? I say it's about 50%, Tiffany, but in some ways you're introducing a separate element, fight and flight. So whether you're an individual or you're a group, you can be in a threatening situation, which puts you in a defensive crouch, basically a defensive posture. That can be true for groups just as much as for individuals. And so there's an approach mode to our behavior in which we're feeling safe, we're satisfied, our basic needs have been met. And so now we can explore our relationships, explore our environments. That's what we need for positive change as opposed to reactive change. And that's true for both individuals and groups. So if you're only as an individual in the first place, you're probably not in that safe space. Or if you are, it's only thanks to a larger society that needs attention. And so groups are better able to create that safe space for their members. Of course, the first order of business is for the group to be a safe social environment for people to extend themselves. I kind of liken it to a turtle, which is capable of pulling into its shell or coming out of its shell based on how it senses its environment. So when there's danger, the turtle pulls into its shell and there it sits. It's not going to go anywhere, is it? When it's safe, the turtle comes out of its shell and it trundles about very happily. So we are those turtles. <laughs> and so we need to create the social environment that enables us to come out of our shells. And when we do, you don't have to teach a turtle to come out of its shell. It knows how to do that. You just have to provide the environment for it to come out of its shell. I like that analogy. So then can you explain about how your organization, specifically the spin-off the pro-social world, has that appropriate structure so that people can start to come out of their turtle shell? Well, we rely heavily on Two pillars, as we call it, but let me just introduce the first one based on a woman named Eleanor Ostrom. And I'm curious to know 
if you and, and your audience already knows about her, so I can ask you, I'm not trying to shame you. To- no, it's okay. I'm not familiar. So I'm very interested because I was doing my research before this website. And so I didn't, her name wasn't popping up. So I have not heard of her. So I am very interested in who she is and how she's impacted us. This illustrates something very important that I call the archipelago problem, which is that many islands of thought and practice with little communication among islands. The word silo conveys the same thing. What that means is that somebody like Eleanor Ostrom can be as famous as she could possibly be on her island, on her particular domain, and totally unknown beyond her borders. That's the case with her and with most other people that you can talk about. And one of the things that needs to be done is to actually address the archipelago problem, because so many times you find either ideas or practices that actually work very well. People have figured things out. They're functioning just fine. Thank you very much. But because of the way it's all framed and has arisen, it, it doesn't spread beyond its borders. And so what's needed is a common language, a way for you to explain things. And we can say such things as all groups need to be cooperative. Cooperation is something that all groups need. It doesn't matter what they're doing. They have to cooperate to do it. And adaptability is something that all groups need, especially in this day and age. Do you know there was a time in which every generation was like the one that preceded it? It was not required to change, change, but now it is. And so if you're not flexible, either as an individual or an organization, forget it. You'll, you'll be left behind. And so cooperation and adaptability are two things that all groups need and that we think that we have the tools that we can, we can provide for any group, no matter what it's doing, and any scale. Let's bring scale into this. We've already talked about individuals forming into groups, but of course, those groups are tiny compared to what needs to be done ultimately at a global scale. And so the concept of multi-level comes in very importantly. If we're really going to change the world, we have to organize social life at multiple levels. Think of like levels of governance, everything from town governance up to county to city to state to federal and hopefully international, although that's very weak, and multiple contexts. This is very demanding what is required for true social change. But these principles are actually applicable across all of those scales. And so we might be talking, for example, about the Ukraine crisis, or we might be talking about just a problem within your particular group. Isn't it great that we have a vocabulary that can accommodate such different things. But shall I proceed with Eleanor Ostrom? Yes, yes. I, I am curious. Is this a real person or is this just like a theory? You know, No, Eleanor was a real person. Oh, okay. <laughs> Eleanor Ostrom was a political scientist and she's the tragedy of the commons. And I'm betting that most of your audience knows that term. It's basically when any group is attempting to manage a common resource, like a forest or a lake or a pasture or the groundwater, there is a temptation for its members to take more than their share. And that leads to the overuse of the resource. So that's the tragedy of the commons. And economic wisdom was the tragedy would always occur. And so the only solution is to privatize the common, which you can't always do. But the whole concept of privatization owes itself to this idea of the tragedy of the commons. Or if you can't privatize the resource and you cannot privatize the groundwater or the air, then you have to regulate it, some kind of top-down regulation. And what Eleanor discovered by actually studying groups that are attempting to manage common pool resources is actually they varied, back to that variation word, they varied in their ability to avoid the tragedy. And some of them were capable of self-managing. They could manage their own affairs did not need top-down regulation, did not need to privatize the resource, and that these groups had in common what she called eight core design principles, which are like the recipe of success for self-managing their resources. And so that's what made her so important, was her identification of these eight core design principles, which I will list in just a minute. So she did this as a political scientist, And then ultimately, she won the Nobel Prize in economics, even though she was an outsider. At the time she won the Nobel Prize, most economists have never even heard of her, back to the archipelago. And then even after winning the Nobel Prize in economics, she remains unknown in other domains. And so her work illustrates 
the archipelago problem really well. And then I worked with her for three years prior to her death in 2012. And what we did together was to generalize those core design principles. So now we're in a position to describe them in a way that is relevant to any group at all. And so would you like me to list the core design principles? Shall I? Yes, please. And often when I do this, I ask my audience, so people listening to this, to please think of a group that you know well. It could be any kind of group at all that you know well, and then see if this group implements the core design principles well or poorly, and if that might influence how well that group functions. So the first core design principle is a strong sense of identity and purpose. The group needs to know that it's a group. What it's doing needs to be perceived as important. We need to know who is the member, what is their rights in the group. So a strong sense of identity and purpose is probably the most important core design principle. Number two is that benefits must be proportionate to cost, not sustainable for some members of the group to get most of the benefits and for other members of the group to do most of the work. Turtles pull into their shells under those circumstances. Number three, fair and inclusive decision-making, not sustainable for some members of the group to call the shot and to make decisions that influence other members of the group. That is a recipe for unfairness, and it also does not make use of the wisdom of everyone in the group. Number four, monitoring agreed-upon behaviors. We must know that we're doing what we agreed to do. (laughs) And if we can't do that, of course, all bets are off. Number five, graduated responding to helpful and unhelpful behaviors. If you're not doing what you should, well, that needs to be corrected. But we don't need to be mean about it, at least not at first. I mean, most people, you know, are fail now and then, and a friendly reminder is enough. But in some cases, it is necessary to escalate and ultimately exclude people from the group if they just can't get along. And so that response to unhelpful behavior has to be able to escalate. And while we're doing that, then we should also be abundantly praising and reinforcing helpful behavior. So abundant support for helpful behavior, coupled with mild punishment for unhelpful behavior that escalates only when necessary. There's a whole piece there that's very important. Uh, Number six, a fast and fair conflict resolution. Conflicts will occur in a group eventually, and they must be resolved as quickly as possible and in a manner that's regarded as fair by all parties. And so uh, number seven, authority to self-govern. A group must have elbow room to manage their own affairs. And if they're being dictated from without, then of course, all bets are off. And number eight, appropriate relations with other groups, which reflect the same core design principles. And so here we see the scale and dependence. These principles are needed to govern relations among groups, in addition to relations within groups, all the way up to nations and giant corporations as members of the global village. And so there they are, eight core design principles. And I wonder, what do you think of them? Uh, I don't know if you brought a group to mind, but what are your own thoughts on them? Yes, I thought of a group. And okay. um, as I was going through, I was like, oh, this is bad. This is bad. <laughs> so, yes, it was very interesting to compare the two. <laughs> Tiffany, when we do this with groups, we introduce the core design principles. We take a little longer, but you can see they're very simple and intuitive. And so we ask them after only a slightly longer introduction, we say, first of all, do you understand these principles? And typically they say, of course. And then we ask, do you think these principles might be important for your group? And they say, well, we do think that. And then we ask, well, how well does your group implement these principles? And then there's that aha moment. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh (laughs) Absolutely. So you were saying that there are two pillars to the pro-social world. You introduced Eleanor Ostrom, and then you were talking about the eight core designs. What is the second pillar? Well, the second pillar is called contextual behavioral science, which sounds super geeky. And it stems a lot from behaviorism, you know, good old BF Skinner and forms of therapy at the individual level or training called behavioral cognitive and mindfulness-based therapy. It it works on the flexibility part. So we've already covered the cooperation and the governance. But when you look at how flexible people are, once again, we come back to variation. Some people are more flexible than others. In one of the studies that I have in mind, they related flexibility to response to stress in your life. So just about everyone experiences stress in their lives. But when does that compromise mental health? 
And it tends to compromise mental health in people that are not flexible. They don't know how to deal with these stresses, and so it wears upon them. But if you're flexible, then basically you're capable of responding and adapting in some sense so that these stressful events do not compromise your mental health. And so it turns out that techniques have been developed to teach flexibility. It's not something you're born with. It's something that you can learn if you're not already flexible. And so the uh, contextual behavioral science pillar teaches those flexibility tools. And there might not be enough time, Tiffany, in in this conversation for me to go into it in detail. I was going to ask you to because I'm very, very curious. Well, I'm happy to do so. And it brings us back to approach and avoid. And so often, we are reacting to things in our lives. And these things are adaptive. When you're in a defensive crouch, when your turtle is pulled into your shell, that's an adaptive response. There are so many things that we have learned to do, and often without knowing it unconsciously, that are serving us well, but only in an extremely limiting sense. So for example, we might want a a great relationship with our partner, but we might also want to control them. We might worry that they'll leave us. And so we'll now behave towards them in a way which is serving our interests in some narrow sense, but not in any kind of long-term sense. And so life is full of things in which we're responding in ways that are adapted in a limited sense, but they're not taking us towards our valued goals at all. I mean, as far as anything expansive for ourselves or our groups, forget about the whole earth, they're part of the problem, not part of the solution. And so what these methods do is they, first of all, they cause you to reflect upon what are your valued goals? What are the directions that you really want to move towards? And that would be something like a great relationship with your partner or helping my neighborhood address uh, sustainability goals or anything pro-social. To fix that in your mind, what's the valued direction that you want to go? So we build up your values that way. And that becomes an evolutionary terms of target of selection. This is what we're going to try to do. Well, that's in your head, values are. And so what would you actually do in order to achieve these valued goals? Now you build up the action part. And so these are the behaviors that you really want to select, the enlightened behaviors. Well, now we drop back into your head and we say, isn't it curious that even though this is what you want, in some enlightened sense, there's other things in your head that are getting in the way of that, these things that I just referred to. Let's think about them. Don't ignore them. They exist. They're part of you. And so what are these things that are hooking you and becoming part of the problem in terms of reaching these valued goals? And how do they manifest as behaviors? So this is a reflection. And of course, just like the core design principles, I can state them briefly, but they could also occupy a lifetime. But when you see the world this way, and you accept these problematic elements, and then you commit to working around them in order to achieve your valued goals, then you're doing a kind of conscious evolution in which you are basically taking control of the target of selection and your repertoire of behaviors, and you're replicating the best practices. A lot of this is very convergent on meditational practices. I spend a lot of time with, you know, Buddhist practitioners, for example, and all the time they're talking about good and bad seeds, which you can water. You need to water the good seeds and not the bad seeds. So to conclude, once again, there's a kind of methodology, you might say, tools that you can use both as an individual and as a group to become more flexible and to become more mindful or conscious about what we're selecting. And that's the second pillar provided by contextual behavioral science, along with the Ostrom core design principles, both described in such a general way that any group of any size and any objective can uh, find them helpful. Thank you for sharing all that. I've taken copious notes. I'm sure a lot of other listeners are as well, because this is amazing stuff. So just to clarify, so you work with small organizations, and if anyone is interested in reaching out to you, all of that contact information can be in the show notes. Is it just like community groups or is it uh, specific companies and organizations? Or I mean, is there a specific group that you work with more just for anyone who is interested in working with you and the work that you're doing? Well, on the one hand, I want to invite everyone listening to this to contact us and to get involved. I've already talked about the generality of the principles, that these principles solve the archipelago problem and that they're scale independent. And so we are working with economics, with spirituality, with schools and youth, with regenerative culture, with entrepreneurship, 
definitely with businesses. We recently we've made a connection with the conscious capitalism movement, which is very exciting. And so, yes, everyone should contact us. But then at the same time, of course, we're just a very small organization, still growing, still very new at what we're trying to do. And so the question as to whether we can accommodate that kind of interest is an open question. But one thing I've learned, and I'm sure that our listeners have the same experience, you learn by doing. And one of my favorite Zen koans is leap and a net will appear. And so if this intrigues you, if you want to learn more, then contact us at hello at prosocial.world. It's very easy to remember, hello at prosocial.world. And the liner notes will provide more information. And then we will begin a relationship with you as best we can. And of course, if you're bringing resources to the table, if you have capacity, then things will go still better. Wonderful. Dr. Wilson, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for the amazing work that you are doing in the world. I really appreciate you speaking with us. Thanks to you. Thank you for listening to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. I hope you feel inspired by today's guest to find and lead with what makes you stand out and to take your own action in the world. Visit us at humanitarian-entrepreneur.com for the latest inspiring content and ways we can help drive change in your business or nonprofit.